I can start. What do you want to do? I'll start. Hey, everyone. Thank you for coming to the week eight edition of Show and Tell. We're almost done with the term, but yet we still have so far to go, right? Lots to do, but it's good stuff. And I, um, speaking of good stuff, I want to remind you of the upcoming good market that's going to be happening. Do you like that segue? Was that good? Okay. <laughs> speaking of good stuff, um, the upcoming good market that is going to be happening December 5th and 6th at the Simon Benson House and land gallery for two days okay which is great we're going to get tons of people coming to look at your work but what we need is your work okay we need you to be making things um i am more than happy to brainstorm ideas of how your wonderful smart intelligent design projects can be turned into consumable goods for money okay <laughs> that's always that's always a fun transaction and it's going to happen, and I'm really excited to have the another year of Good Market happening. So there's going to be an information session happening when? After. After Show and Tell. So it's a great opportunity for you to learn more, or if you just have questions about the stuff that you're making, at 1 p.m. today after Show and Tell, there's going to be an information session, so stick around, okay? And now I'm going to hand this over to Max Miller. <coughs> Hello. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, so the annex deadline got extended to 2 p.m. today, so you still have time to email your stuff to annexzine at gmail.com if, if you want to do that. <laughs> if you don't get it, you can do it. <laughs> like eight weeks, and it's still just like nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> Frentorship has a show coming up on Thursday, December 3rd, called Lost and Found. Um, it's at Tillamook Station from 6 to 9, and it's always super fun. Frentorship's really cool. You should take Frentorship if you haven't, and then you can be in cool things like this show. There are posters and stuff. I don't have one. Um, the similarly different info meeting is on January 14th next term. Um, Briar will be talking about it and what... It, uh, what you do, how much it costs, and how to sign up. Um, and there will be some students who went last summer. What is it? Where do they go? Oh, right. You should probably explain that. Uh, it's a trip to London for three and a half, three and a half ish weeks, where you work with students at the University of Arts London College of Design, and you learn stuff, and you make stuff. And you have a show, and you get to be in London, which is really cool. Um, I went, and I'll be sharing my experiences on January 14th at 1 after show and tell. Anything else? Anybody else have an announcement they want to share? Cool. Great. <clears throat> so, Kristen Rogers Brown joined Bitch Media. It's a cuss on purpose. <laughs> as art director in March 2010. Though her first love in design was print, she loves finding the right media for the message and believes in keeping a balance of form, function, and delight in all the details of her work, whether it's brand development, packaging, identity, or web design. Kristen serves as an assistant professor at PNCA, where she runs the senior studio in the illustration department, moonlights in various design courses, and mentors thesis students. When not designing, Kristen frequents water parks, swoons for David Bowie, stocks jewelry designers and illustrators, attempts to sew, and runs or rides her bike around Portland. She's an insomniac, part narcoleptic, and quite possibly the messiest perfectionist ever. So a big round of applause. A big round of applause for, for Kristen Rogers. Thank you. That you said a big round of applause, <laughs> like perfect. Especially considering um, that I what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I I'm really excited to be here. I feel like I know a lot of you guys. I see a lot of familiar faces, even if I haven't met you all. And um, I've come into PSU a few times to do critiques, so I feel like this is a nice welcome environment here. So thanks for being here. Um, I have been doing design for almost 20 years now, I realized, as I was putting this talk together. And 
Bitch has been around for almost 20 years too. So even though I have only been at Bitch for five years, I feel like we kind of grew up next to each other and I've, I've been aware of, of Bitch that whole time. Um, and I wanted to sort of frame my talk, not only rooted in the work of Bitch, but in the idea of creative tensions. I'm, I'm a little bit full of angst um, bitch, I think, grew out of a time that was framed with Riot Girl and um, a lot of, a lot of, um, I think, social good, social practice work. And I think that's really important to my design practice too. So I think the idea of creative tensions, creating good work, um, is really important to me. Um, so this is me, <laughs> rather than show, um, start with showing some of my work. This is my tiny art director pose. <laughs> so before I came to Bitch, um, as Max said, my first love in design was really publications. I started off actually working as a production manager for a book publisher based out of Boulder, Colorado. I had done freelance work in design before that, but it was working at a book publisher that I realized that you know, really form follows function. Um, print media is to me not dead, but I think rooted in print, I learned a lot of problem solving and um, finding inspiration in um, budgets and really good community and smart people. When I moved to Portland, I started really working as a designer rather than production manager exclusively. And these are some samples from my work with the Bear Deluxe magazine that's still around. I've been a creative director there since I since I moved to Portland. And through all of my various iterations of my design career, I, as I mentioned, I've done a lot of work with sustainability and social change. I've worked with large firms, small firms, as a freelancer, as an in-house designer, which is underrated, you get a lot of freedom to do cool projects as an in-house designer. And one of the things I've liked about kind of coming in and out of all of those environments is that you really find your own voice as a creative professional. Even as your work changes, you find the things that are important to you doing that. I've always had sort of two things going on in my career at the same time. Um, right now, I'm working at Bitch and I'm teaching at PNCA. I'm also freelancing a little bit, so that's three things, I guess, more than two things. Um, in college, I actually majored in English Lit and studio art initially before I found design. Um, so I think I've always had that sort of tension and balance between two things. When I was um, before I started working at Bitch, I was working at a pretty good-sized um, consulting firm, which sounds like it could be the most boring job ever, but I actually learned a lot about psychology and um, <clears throat> being impulsive versus control and finding great opportunities to do really creative work within a strict structural system. At the same time, I looked outside of that environment for interesting social good projects and did a lot of work with American or AIGA, which at the time was American Institute of Graphic Arts. I was on the board for six years and um, still am involved with them. So a little bit about Bitch's history. Let's delve into that work. Bitch started as a zine in the mid 90s. And this is, we're leading into our 20th anniversary year next year. So um, from the very first days, Bitch was a lot of it hand-drawn. The covers were hand-drawn, as you can see here, um, hand-stapled, distributed out of the back of our co-founder's car, station wagon in Oakland, California. And it debuted to some pretty great reviews. There were a lot of zines at the time, um, 1990. Five, six, I think is when they really got their footing. And it was a couple of years before they even started using color in the covers. So you can see how the work kind of evolved through that period. You can see that the 
Branding for Bitch, though, has been fairly consistent over the years. The logo evolution started with a hand-drawn woman reading, and then you can see the typography adjustments have been pretty subtle, just um, kind of going with the design trends of the time. The thing that I love about the logo in its current iteration is that it's really, really bold and still doesn't scream at you. The lowercase letters, the typeface is actually one that's it's interstate. It's actually one that's used for road signs. And so I feel like it's kind of a, I think of that road sign thing, I think of it as kind of like a guiding a guiding sign on the magazine. And it really stands out in the newsstand. So um, before I even got to Bitch, I feel like it grew up a lot in terms of design. You can see that through the covers. This starts um, right after the kind of zine era and then goes all the way up to, you can see at the bottom right, um, the bottom at least couple of rows were designed by Briar Lovett who I know teaches here, and a lot of you guys have had in class. And um, you can see not only did the color evolve, but the printing evolved during that time. Um, the organization still stayed pretty small, and the design team stayed pretty small, team of often one, um, and sometimes interns, sometimes not. Um, but you can see the logo basically just got bigger, bolder during that time. And I've kind of kept that through my design because I think it's working well. Another thing that stayed the same as we're heading into our 20th year, I curated a show at the Museum of, of Contemporary Craft in Portland, which is up now. And you can see a lot of the stuff that we use to make the covers and some of the, um, the early um, proofs and the film that was used to print the magazine, which we've saved in the archives. It was so cool to look through this stuff just as a designer now and a designer who started out working when this stuff was still a way of working. Um, it was hard to kind of capture it all in film, but you can see some of that ephemera on the left. And the stuff on the right is stuff that I've made. Um, stuff in the middle, Briar's done a lot of that stuff, and our first art directors and our <coughs> co-founder, Andy, who's an illustrator as well, um, show some of her hand-drawn stuff in original sketches. We're all really interested in making physical things and putting those in the magazine. So starting off as a zine, I feel like that's still really part of our brand. And one of the, um, I guess, creative tensions that I've been thinking about that that sprung out of is budget. It's beautiful, but we have really limited budgets as a nonprofit and as a feminist organization too. Um, I feel like now is the time that we're seeing more and more buzz about being a feminist and about that being marketable. But I would say in the five years that I've been a bitch, that's changed radically. I, when I started, I was still sort of like, well, I'm gonna go work in a feminist magazine. And I was excited about it, but some of my old coworkers were like, whoa, good luck with the money on that. Um, I do love the making of things though, and that's always been a part of my work too, as a as somebody who went to school for fine art. What I think is interesting is with um, with time and with the design trends the way that they are, that has grown up in a different way. So I still like the handmade aesthetic. It's just a little bit more polished. We're kind of, I kind of joined Bitch when we were 15 and I feel like I've taken us through our teenage years a little bit. Now we're hitting 20, I've really been thinking about that. The cover on the right is a, it, or that's a detail from the cover um, that I worked with an intern from PSU on Jasmine Silver and an illustrator who lived in the UK at the time, Carolina Schnorr. Carolina did the illustration and then we made the paper cut. We did the printing and layered it here. So it was a really nice collaboration that we probably couldn't have done very well if we hadn't the experience in collaborating sort of across oceans <laughs> and without the, um, the attention to detail that Jasmine and, and I had, mostly Jasmine. I'm bad with an exacto knife. So this is the start of my cover design at Bitch. Um, my first cover had a unicorn and gold ink on it, which I'm very proud of. 
when I did this cover, my dad was like, oh, you're doing what you should have been doing your whole life. <laughs> I would agree, um, both for our unicorns and gold ink, but also for our smart take on feminism and pop culture. I get to watch TV for my job. That's really awesome. I also get to read really smart um, criticism by amazing women and men and humans. And we have dogs in our office sometimes too, which is also great. So it's pretty much a dream job. Um, you can see that the logo has remained the same. It's pretty much the biggest we can have the word bitch on the cover. So I feel like the logo does all the work in selling it on the newsstand for me. Um, I keep our sort of cover lines right at the top of the magazine because anymore on a newsstand, you just see the very top of the magazine. And I, I think about um, what someone told me was kind of the 15 foot rule. You're standing looking at a newsstand 15 feet away, it should grab you and suck you in. So one of the things I was excited about working at Bitch is that um, we could have it be really poppy in terms of color as well as content. So I've tried to keep that a part of the look and feel as well. And I was told when I started that the photographed covers sold a little bit better than just illustrated covers. I'm not sure if that's so true anymore. I've been experimenting with illustration because I teach illustration. Um, but I've been trying to figure out ways to keep it sort of a three-dimensional photographed crafty object as well as use illustration in the work because I think it tells a really great story. This takes us all the way up through the latest, the Nerds issue at the bottom right. Every issue has a theme, which to me feels a little bit more like a journal or an art magazine than, a, I guess, like a typical periodical that comes out every month or quarterly. And you can see as, as we go forward, the color and the sense of craft in these is probably the only thing that I that I try to keep the same in the design. I try to really change it up so that you're surprised when you see bitch. During my time there, so I've done 24 covers. I've also redesigned our website completely. You can see the first iteration of the website, which I think launched in 2000, the mid 2000s. Um, that screenshot is from the mid 2000s at the left. The middle one is from right before we launched our new website design in August. And the one on the right is our new site. Our new site is completely responsive. So as you grow your screens, it grows. To even say that right now today that we just redesigned it to be that way is a little bit embarrassing because um, I feel like all websites should be that way now. But it was amazing to design for this format. Um, as the only designer at Bitch doing this project, this was a huge undertaking. But I'm really proud that we were able to do it. We worked with an outside firm in programming. And I was able to bring in a couple of trusted folks to help me with ideas for it. And we have a huge team of smart people who provided input. So I definitely didn't feel like I was doing it alone. But sometimes I felt like I was doing it alone, too. I also think that one of the um, one of the things that people don't think about with web design is that as a publication designer, depending on how you think about your work, when you go to web design, you're actually solving similar problems. You're thinking about your readers, your users. You're thinking about how people's eyes move around the page or the screen, and you're hoping that people enter into content in multiple ways. So when I first started doing design, I worked with a really great art director who was like, you know, your work could be really amazing. It's interactive work because you're thinking about the page in all these different ways in your sense of typography. It's good. Now that we have all of these potential solutions for ways to think about work in different formats, you can really utilize your love of print or packaging to just apply that to a website. And I really felt that in this project. We also redesigned the print magazine, which I'm going to hold up an actual print magazine here because we just got it today. So my photographs of it are not fantastic. Um, 
I'm excited to do more of this. I think anytime you redesign a publication, the first issue, you're like, ah, oh, what's it gonna look like? And then after maybe a year, you start to really love it and grow into it. So I love it, but I'm gonna love it more in like a year. During my time, I've been able to hire my first part-time designer to work with. Um, he helped me put all of our content as digital editions, they're PDF digital editions, but that's important to me for many reasons, including accessibility for people with um, visual impairments, as well as sustainability, and just for purposes of keeping them. I mean, the print copies will only last for so long. I've worked with illustrators all over the world. And there's a lot of nerdy stuff that I do too as part of my job, especially as part of, as being the only um, designer at the beginning of my time. And as part of a staff that was nine people small when I started, um, I really care about the math involved with my job too. So when I started, I was able to negotiate a 15% cost savings on printing. We have a with some fancy numbers, about a 22% reduction in the amount of pulped issues in the first year. So for you guys who are really geeky about this, when you send magazines to distributors, they throw them all over the store. Sometimes they use them kind of as wallpaper they talk about. Um, it's, it's For some people, it's great because that makes your magazine really visible. But a lot of times those don't get bought. So then when they're out of cycle when the quarter is over, they just scrap them, they shred them. And that was that was a lot of money that we were wasting and a lot of paper that we were wasting. Um, as I said, sustainability is super important to me. So we moved to printing all of our magazines on paper from responsible sources with an FSC certified printer and process. And all of our promotional stuff that we actually print and our letterhead and all that stuff is FSC certified as well. And despite what you hear, print is not dead. And magazines, at least our magazine, is built on a different sort of a model. I talked a little bit about how the web design takes advantage of its media. I think a print design should be taking advantage of that as well. Our business model is built off of membership as a nonprofit organization rather than advertising. So we actually have an audience that invests in us instead of trying to sell ads for our stuff. And through our website, we have a series of podcasts and um, speakers, events like this. We actually have built our audience and our, our membership is growing annually, which is exciting. And our readership is growing because of that. Um, I also get to write as part of my job, and at the bottom of the page here, you can see some of the, the articles that I've written for Bitch. A lot of them are about design. I also sometimes get to geek out on music and do playlists and things like that. That's part of the glory of being such a small staff, but it's also part of my background and the stuff that I love. So that brings me to kind of the meat of my talk, which I've kind of loosely framed on these creative tensions in my work. Um, and I developed these sort of meditations or truths, I was looking for the right word, mantras maybe, that sort of ring through my head when I'm really stressed out, um, things that balance me, things that center me. And I really think that stress makes great work. <laughs> I'm very pressure prompted. Um, I was talking to Kate about this a minute ago. I'm, a, I'm kind of a hot mess in my space. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of love it. I mean, I'm one of those people who my desk is crazy town. I have paper everywhere, but I know what where everything is truly most of the time. Um, and But it's a controlled chaos. So I'm going to share, I'm going to be vulnerable and share some of that with you guys. So the first thing is to trust radically. I have thought this for a long time and it's a little bit of a um it's a hard thing for me to do because i'm a control freak i think all designers are a little bit of control freak um so there's a little bit of a push pull with that but i really believe that if you 
trust somebody before they've earned it, they will step up to that trust. These are some layouts by different people for the magazine as they were trying to interpret my style that I love more than some of my designs, actually. The one on the left is by Karina Bunn, who graduated from PSU and was my intern. The ones on the right are by Alex Dublin, who is my new designer and who actually was originally an illustrator. He was one of my mentees at um, PNCA. And I basically was in production. I get about, if I'm lucky, two weeks to lay out 80 pages of the magazine. And uh, I'm trying not to use the word shit show in my talk, but that's what I was feeling like it was. Whoops, I just used it. Um, and I needed help, and I was excited to give them the work but I was more excited when I got these layouts back. And I basically just gave them the page and a couple of thoughts about the grid and they went nuts. And I think it's, I think it's amazing. Alex, I hadn't seen much of his work with photography and he made these beautiful, kind of hard to see here, but you can see them in the, um, in the newest issue, actually the nerds issue that's on the back table. And I just think their interpretation of the grid and of type was really beautiful. So I really believe that people will step up and own it. The worst, I, I always ask myself, what's the worst that can happen if you trust someone before they've earned it? What do I have to lose? It's not open heart surgery, it's design. It'll probably be okay. And you know, so I have to redo it if I don't like it. This is another example of a project that um, required a lot of trust on a lot of different levels. This is the cover of our frontier issue and a uh, detail from it. Um, on the right, you can actually see our inspiration. We brainstorm all our covers together as a staff, which is awesome because I can't have a new idea by myself every cover, much as I love creative freedom. It's good to have a team. We were thinking about frontier as terrain and also as technology being sort of new frontier. So we actually had this um, it's not a motherboard, it's a circuit board. It's an actual physical circuit board manufactured on the left. And we were talking about this concept of how they look like neighborhoods. And as a staff, my intern Jasmine at the time said, oh, my dad makes those or works for a company who makes those. And we could maybe design one and it wouldn't work, but it would look great. So, um, there was no way that my brain could get around all of the little neighborhoods in this design and the line work by myself, much as I kind of wanted to have that attention to detail, but she could help. And this was the first time that I had ever worked with an intern on a cover, which is not necessarily a bad idea at all, but um, it just kind of, they're the cover, you know, it's a, it's a big deal and you want to make sure that it's the right person to trust when you do it. So. We worked on it together. We actually emailed files back and forth. We were all up in each other's business making this cover and these files. And I, I love this cover. Um, this is actually on the bottom right here. This is actually the illustrator file that we sent to the printer. This is really tiny. Um, it's, it's in two layers. There are two pieces of it. And they made these two plastic pieces with metal on top of it. But you can see the word, if you get really close, you can see the word frontier designed in the circuits. And then we physically made this thing. We glued it together and glued these little um, pieces of metal on it. And I physically sawed this die line out of it. So we had like two of these. So I had to trust Jasmine. I had to trust myself with the saw. I had to <laughs> trust that this was gonna come out and then we photographed it and I think it. I think it was a really great learning experience for me. So reveal your vulnerability is my second point. Um, I'm doing that by, um, I, I think I do it most with my mentees and with my students and in talking about my work. I used to be, I think when I was less experienced, I used to try to be more polished. And the older I get and the more experienced I get, the more I say things like shit show in public and admit that I'm a hot mess and um, talk about my dog on Twitter. And I think these are the things that make you human. And they're the reasons that people actually want to work with you. And I think that um, 
the more you reveal your, well, not always the more, I think it's a push-pull with strength and vulnerability. When you say you don't know, you get back strength, you get back learning. When you admit it, I, I, there's also that sort of fake it till you make it mentality. And I think it's okay to try to step up to that, but sometimes a well-placed, I actually don't know what I'm talking about here, um, brings people to you and, and lets people see that you're a human being, which is really nice. So these are some examples of how that plays out in technical work. This is an illustration from one of my former students, Molly Mendoza, who is just crazy talented, um, but hadn't done a lot of two color work before. And I work in two color for the magazine all the time. And also with my work for the Bear Deluxe, I've done a lot of weird stuff with spot color. So she gave me some files and I told her this was gonna be kind of an experiment and she could she trust me? with her layered files. And I took the black color and put it in a spot channel. And I took the color layer and put that in a spot channel and told the printer that I was gonna live with the results and trust it. Um, I've done this before. So the printer had to be okay with me doing this experiment too. But Molly had to trust me. Um, I had to admit that I didn't know how this was going to come out. Our, uh, our development director had to trust that this was going to look good in the end. And then I had to convince the press guy on press that this was this like playing with the ink on press was going to be OK, too. You can see the press check over here. We were at this point arguing about whether the blue and the orange were going to make mud or not. But by doing this, I admitted where I had done this before and then a little bit where I hadn't. And I actually learned a little bit even now after doing this for 15 years or so um, about how the inks mix and how that dries back. And it's just it's super geeky stuff and I love it. I think um, from a technical standpoint too, Molly learned a little bit about it and I'm, I follow her on Instagram and I'm seeing her work like change a little bit when she does limited color work because of that, it's really fun. So I think you need to embrace your flaws. I guess that was kind of my point. Uh, it was funny that Max said that earlier, but I, I learned that working at the consulting firm too. My strengths are not being perfect. They're being flawed. And I think that um, in you see it in illustration work when a hand, you know, when hand lettering kind of breaks down, you see it in ink strokes, you see it in layouts when things break the grid. Third point, allow silence. So my parents were both musicians. My mom was a concert pianist and my dad is an orchestra director. And I a lot of times think of design work as musical. And music is made up of notes and rests. And without the rest, it wouldn't have any melody or form. And I think about that when I, both in terms of process and in terms of visuals. So white space, obviously, is a good example of that. One of the first things I did with layouts at Fitch was make the type a little bit smaller, actually, to make it more readable. Um, that was a little bit of a battle with my coworkers, both because on one hand, they felt like if we're paying all this money as a nonprofit to make this magazine, if people saw white space, they would think we were wasting money. And also they were afraid it wouldn't be readable. And I have been able to prove to them that with white space, you can actually rest. You can actually rest your eyes. Some more examples of that. I really, I think of my work in general as being syncopated. A lot of times I'll work with a, a kind of a complicated, weird grid. These are based on a five column grid. And a lot of times I'll take the columns of text and I'll stretch them in different um, combinations. Sometimes on the same spread, I'll use like a three column on one, or three columns of text on one side and two on the other. And I'll play with that balance. It works really well when you're laying out art spreads like this one. I think it also works really well with text. Um, I think when you have really text heavy layouts, it can kind of jolt you into 
noticing type and into reading things differently um, and just stop you from just sort of like monot monotonously flipping through. One of the things that one of our advertisers told me when I first started working in Bitch was that they saved the issue until they had time to look through it and that sometimes they wouldn't look through it for a couple of months. And it was kind of the next issue coming up that made them read it. And I, I used to feel that way about some magazines. I read like The New Yorker was a magazine that I used to read that I have stopped reading because it's kind of a wall of text sometimes. And I don't want people to feel that way with Bitch. The content is already pretty dense and I'd like the magazine to be flippable. So these are some shots from our redesign. These are our reviews pages. The left shows before, the right shows after. And we have the same amount of content, but I widened the columns a little bit. We added a sidebar. We made a ginormous pull quote, which I'm still a little unsure about. And we clustered our images together to create more white space, which I think creates that kind of rest. In addition to creating the silence in the layout, I try to create some room for silence in the ways that I talk to people too. Sometimes when you're having a conversation with somebody in a, I think especially in a corporate environment, people jump in to fill space in a conversation. And it is really hard not to do that. Um, in a critique, I'll do that too with my students. I'll like, I'm, I'm still struggling with this, I guess. Um, I'll just like ask questions or I'll, I'll comment on something for like five minutes. <laughs> Oops. Ah. Um, so I'm making a measured effort to just let there be dead air sometimes. And it's interesting how people step up to fill that or how you can see wheels turning. I'm an introvert and this is why I'm doing it. I think it's a more, um, it's a more progressive way of making room for other people. And I have to do that in my process too. It's hard to do when you're super busy, but you, I think you all need to do it. It's, I think work is made up of periods of intense busyness and then also reflection. And if you can't reflect and edit yourself, you're not gonna get anything done. You're not gonna make progress. You're just gonna be blindly like answering people's work requests. So speaking of music, John Cage was a, um, an American experimental <laughs> composer. And one of his often quoted phrases is to begin anywhere. And there's no wrong way to get started, but not knowing where to get started is one of the most common forms of paralysis in your work. I have to remind myself of this constantly. The blank page is terrifying to me, um, especially in a sketchbook. I have a pretty erratic sketchbook practice. And once you begin, I think the key point to this is once you get started, you need to be deliberate about it. So there's no wrong way to get started, but um, I think John Cage sort of followed this in his work. He did some crazy things with music where it was very deconstructed and, and what would seem um, mathy, I guess, or hard to listen to even, but he definitely followed his system through to the end. And I try to do that in my work. So this is where I started with the redesign of our magazine. Thumbnails, squiggles, this means, these are like hieroglyphs, but they mean something to me. This is how I started our web redesign too. I think it's really important if you're stuck to just give yourself the freedom to start wherever you can start. And that's, that's not wrong. Another example of that, our tough issue cover. Um, I think we had a really great metaphor for this cover with these jawbreakers being both tough and sweet. And I knew that I wanted to break them open and look at the inside of them, but I didn't know how we were gonna do that. And I didn't know what I wanted the cover to look like. So I actually worked on this photo shoot with my partner, Ryan, and he was very kind about letting me try to break them open with a hammer and break stuff. And I shot this at school in one of our classrooms, actually a lot like this one, messier than this one, with natural light. 
and some blue construction paper. And we just broke these and took like a hundred photos in different light with different settings with a new camera we had never used before. And when the shadows got weird, we used tin foil and like reflected in the shadows to fill them in. And I swear we have like eight covers for this issue that were totally usable from that photo shoot that said slightly different things. I, I love this cover. This is one of my favorite covers, but I love the process. I love that it was experimental. I love that the metaphor was solid and I love that it really didn't matter which one we used. So that brings me to channel chaos, which I managed before. Chaos is constant in design. And I think that you have to kind of embrace that and then let it go. This is like almost a daily meditation for me, especially when I was the only designer working a bitch. It's much better than now. Um, it brings an element of surprise and delight in your work when things are chaotic. There are new requests every day, but there are also new ideas every day that come out of that. This is my quote that I go back to with it. Without some little element of roots to ground me, I will fly away in a bunch of crazy ideas. But without allowing myself to be flexible, I'll break in that chaos. So this fall, we had the web redesign, we had the magazine redesign, and then we had our annual appeal getting ready to launch all in the same month. And we had all of our holiday stuff that we were doing to get ready for our big promotional season. And this fun project, which I have here, which was a scout book for book nerds called The Little Book of Book Lists, which is something that our um, one of our staff members and I have been dreaming up for about two years, um, wanting to do this project. And the only thing I could do to fit all this work in was just to like make lists and every day just look at the one thing that was in front of me instead of all the things that were due at the same time. So I think that the work that came out of it was amazing. And if I hadn't done it that way, if I hadn't sort of been like, well, we'll see if we can get it all done, I wouldn't have gotten that all done. Another example of that, a more concrete example of that is working with ladybugs. For our primal issue, this was maybe my third issue at Pitch, we decided we were gonna shoot this sort of exotic plant scene. And we bought a little tub of ladybugs that are used in your garden that are in suspended animation. They keep them in the fridge. And then you let them loose in your garden. You open the tub. And if your plants are wet, they just come to life. They wake up and they fly out into your garden and snack on all the bad bugs that are killing your plants. So we did this in Portland and in a studio thinking like, well, it was a floral studio. There are bugs in there. They'll escape when they're done. <laughs> and, uh, and we're like, yeah, it's an art studio. People love ladle, ladybugs. It'll be cool. Um, <laughs> so this photo that you see, you can see the size of the ladybugs. So we ordered a tub of like, I don't know, it was like, 1,500 <laughs> And they come in a little like butter tub this big. And we took them out and it was pretty warm in the studio. So we opened it up and we got the photographer, my friend Jeff, all ready. And we just set it next to this floral arrangement, which was about this big. And the square we have on the cover is like this big. And there were pretty quickly 1500 ladybugs <laughs> flying around. I'm happy to say that we found no dead ladybugs after this photo shoot for anyone who's vegetarian like me. Um, I have to say that. Um, but it was so fun. We were laughing so hard. And it was, it was a ridiculous photo shoot. The best part about this photo shoot, though, was that as we were walking out, we were like loading the camera out. We're like trying not to laugh. And we're in the elevator. We're like going down in this art studio. And this person in the elevator is like, you guys must be good luck. There's like four ladybugs probably on here. And we were finding them in our pants for like a week. So channel chaos. 
The sixth point, create discomfort. There are a lot of situations at Bitch that make me uncomfortable, whether it's deadlines or the lack of money for projects. Um, I am doing what I love, though, and that tension between love and money is a constant that keeps me going. Um, revolutions don't come from comfortable situations. So if you can create discomfort, you can create change. Feminism is hard. I think people joke about um, how feminists aren't funny. And I know a lot of funny feminists, very funny feminists. I think Bitch is pretty funny. And I could name a lot of them. But part of the reason Andy, our co-founder, said this in the last talk I went to with her, so I'm totally stealing it. Um, feminism is really hard. Part of the reason people think that feminists aren't funny is because we're dealing with difficult issues and we've been fighting difficult battles for a long time. And I love that insight. There's times to be funny and there are times to create uncomfortable situations and live with it and fight your way out of it. Doing what you love is hard too. Doing design can be hard. You have to decide if it's worth it. So think about the thing that you love the most. It's probably not easy unless it's pizza. That's kind of easy. Um, I say in my bio and you guys heard him say that I'm the messiest perfectionist ever and I, believe that I create trouble for myself. I've done that for a very long time. I was a smart kid and I was the person who would like ditch a thousand classes and then have a really terrible grade and then have to make up the difference late in the semester. And I'm admitting that even in the face of seeing some of my students in this room who never ditch my classes. Um, I sound like I'm talking to kindergartners. I realized I saying that, but whatever. Um, but I really believe that you can create these messes and resurrect beautiful phoenixes from them. It's, it's hard, but it's worth it. My mind is not a comfortable, beautiful place. Um, and when things get too neat or too beautiful, I don't feel creative. Pinterest stresses me out. <laughs> I feel so pressured by that. Um, make a mess, make things uncomfortable, fix them, make it worth it. This is love satisfying work. This is a tiny example, but break the grid. Work with the edges of the page. Create tension. There are probably way bigger examples of this. But they're small ones too, that's okay. Constraints make good work. Give freely of time, attention, and open discussion of ideas. And remember, this is my last point, that you are never alone, even if you are a freelancer, even if you are the only designer. This is very hard to remember. You can always reach out to someone. It is kind of easier now with your whole interweb community and your, you know, your tweets and your instas or whatever. Um, and as an introvert, sometimes I love being the only person. But you really can't design in a vacuum. To me, that's like an art project. Even you can't make art in a vacuum. There's too much culture that we're talking about. I have illustrators that I reach out to, and one of the best things about my job is working with amazing illustrators. And I love that I get to teach illustration. Um, I have a, a crop of people that I cannot wait to get my mitts on every year who know all of my pet peeves. And I feel empowered by working with them to reach out to people who I have total professional crushes on every year, like these folks, Richie Pope and then Monica Ramos, who I would have been scared to talk to and I now feel like our friends. I'm a megaphone for ideas. I'm not like a solo creator. I, you know, starting off as a writer, designer, or writer, fine artist. I think I never felt comfortable in those worlds. I don't feel like I have a personal style, even though I think I have a personal style of working. Um, people recognize things in my work and I get excited because I'm like, ooh, I do do that. But um, I think it's important to amplify other people's ideas in your work and community is really important to me. So, you know, I, I love the fact that I get 
stuff like this in the mail from illustrators who crush out on me and crush out on bitch. I love that I get to work with amazing students who um, do work that comes back and feeds me like these people who were all folks that I've mentored who are now doing beautiful activist work as well as stuff that I, I couldn't do. I love that when I redesign the magazine, I can call on my favorite people, including in this redesign, my partner, Ryan Brown, who did our icons for the magazine, and Michelle Leal, who graduated from here and was my intern, to do hand lettering, which I feel like added like a degree of humanity to the redesign of the magazine. And I can, I can let that drive my work and be sort of the core of it. So if you're a solo designer, I mean, these are things that I do. I call on people that I trust to pass work back and forth like I did um, on that cover. Um, I make time for critique with outside people. I look for community. I show work to my students sometimes. Um, I tell my students that in our senior studio, we're developing this core of people right now together. And I love seeing them reach out to each other online for critique now that they're kind of out on their own. Um, you're really creating that right now. So I think it's important to nurture it. And I do community projects and events outside of Bitch. I've been focusing on that. But sometimes when people introduce me, they're like, oh, I don't know what to say you do because you do 200 things. Which one do you want to talk about? Um, but that's really important to me. It keeps me fed. I really believe in the idea of gestalt, which is the idea that together we are something other than the sum of our separate parts. Um, I think about that a lot. I think about how the work transforms into something greater. And I brag about the people I collaborate with way more than I do my own work as I'm showing all this stuff. You can probably sense that. So um, these are our design nerds. And I would just leave you with that thought, but together we can do more. Thank you guys. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. I know maybe five minutes or so. And then I have some magazines here. This is our new issue. And there's some for you to take back there too. Yeah. Oh, sorry, no. Oh, just stretching. Just stretching, because I don't have a question for Kristen. You get a magazine. You get a magazine. <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned that you were working at a feminist magazine. You mentioned a couple guys. What's it like in that environment for those guys to be designing at a feminist magazine? Uh, I think, I think fine. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to speak for them, as I hope they wouldn't speak for me. But, you know, when I interviewed at Bitch, I know there were a couple of my friends who were guys who interviewed, too. And when we talked about it afterward, they were, like, kind of jealous that I ended up getting the job. And they're both feminists, and and um, they're, I love their brains. They're people that I, like, contact for critique and stuff like that. But... You know, I think there are a lot of spaces that are really dude heavy too. Like I've worked at companies that were fairly women heavy, but that the whole design team was guys. That's ever me. And I didn't even think about it at the time until I worked at Bitch. Um, and I, sometimes it feels like kind of a breath of fresh air to me. Everybody's pretty low key there though. I don't feel the stress of it. Yeah, that's true. There have been a couple. Are yeah, <laughs> it's true. Believe it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so something just about like the work process, I guess, of a whole like the whole magazine that worked with newspapers and that worked with the magazine that before uh, they like do the it's like just that process and like how long you have to take to do work on a project, I guess. So like you're writing a story and also doing the design of it. How long what are your deadlines, I guess? Right. <laughs> right. Um, 
the print magazine goes on a cycle of it were quarterly. So a lot of times people are pitching things maybe four months out. And the editorial process is a little bit separate from the design process. So I'm hearing about those pitches and I'm able to kind of mull over the ideas while that's happening. But the um, development of the stories happens with our editor in chief sort of separately. And she'll share things with me intermittently. I don't really see anything very solid until about a month before we go to press. I don't get anything to really work with in design until about two weeks before we go to press. But I send stuff to illustrators up to a month out, sometimes less, sometimes way less, sometimes a couple of days before we send it <laughs> to press. I don't usually send that stuff to illustrators. I usually do that myself. Um, but we work really closely, my editor and I will get into the same file. She'll be making changes in the text. That's probably similar to what we've done at newspapers. It's similar to other papers I've worked at. I worked at Willamette Week for a while. It's kind of stressful. Yes, sometimes they get cut. Sometimes the world doesn't end. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. How much time do you give yourself to like brainstorm and like come up with concepts since you're working on like such a short? Like, how much time yeah. Short? Yeah. For covers, that's one of the beautiful things. We have our themes months in advance. <laughs> we usually brainstorm our themes a year in advance. So I'm kind of mulling on them in the back of my head. I may not call them up and be like, okay, this is it, until a month before we start with the stories, probably two months before we start with the stories. Um, usually I do a brainstorm with the entire staff about two months before we go to press so that I can work on the cover before, before we um, start getting the, the content for the layout. In a perfect world, I'd be done with the cover before we start the layout, but sometimes I procrastinate. Yeah? So once you said you showed what like publication and editorial design stuff that you did, what drew you in that direction and like everything that you wish you would have gotten to work on other than editorial? Yeah, I focused on this for this presentation because of Bitch. Um, I love web design and I love packaging. I've done a lot of packaging stuff actually. Um, back before I went to college, actually, I took some drafting classes and um, did some 3D stuff. And I, I think about that in my work. I think it helps with manufacturing, even if you're thinking about paper stocks and how things are going to respond. But, um, but I've done a lot of like boxes and the boxes and kits for things and things like that. I love the idea of doing environmental graphics. Um, I think if there's something I do next, it might be more of that. I do think about branding a lot. I think I have a, I have a lot of experience with that. So that's something that I feel comfortable with. But I think um, I mentioned I do freelance work outside of here. It seems like in my freelance work, I'm doing more branding and web stuff, probably because I do enough with the publications with this that doing more of that feels like too much and I want to stay relevant. But that's part of that push and pull. I think you guys will run into that as you start doing freelance work too, or keep doing freelance work if that's what you're doing. It's like I fill in around what I'm doing for my day job just to keep myself fed and learning. Yeah. Interactive though. I wish I could stay current on everything all the time. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. If you guys want to ask questions, come on up and grab a magazine. I also have a couple of these little book of book lists if you'd like one of those. Yeah. Thank you so much again. That was so thoughtful and wonderful. So oh, really, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming and spending an hour with us and also the time to prepare to talk with us too. So That's awesome. next week is our last show and tell of the term. Okay? And um, it is with Elena Schenker, and she, among other things, she's an art director at Princeton Architectural Press, and she also started the magazine Gratuitous Type. So, which is, if those of you that love magazine design, that is some sexy magazine design, Gratuitous Type, you should check it out. But that is same time, same place. Next week, it's the last one. So, and then we're done. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, a week from, because we have Thanksgiving next week. Do not show up. <laughs> Send it with your family.
families and friends, okay? This is your non school. It's going to be two weeks from today as the last show in South. So, okay. Thank you guys and stick around for good market if you want the.